How's it going, y'all? This is Aaron Burr from the Free Thought Doctrine, and you're listening to the Aaron Burr Broadcast, episode number four. It is January 3rd, 2021. I hope all of you out there had a great Happy New Year and are enjoying a great New Year's weekend. On this episode, I want to cover a number of topics to include some headlines in the news, as well as some points I've discussed in previous episodes I want to reiterate, and I want to dive into a topic regarding certain federal agencies whose mere existence are a direct threat to democracy. The first point I want to make is something that I'm sure a lot of you may have noticed or even partaken in the last year of 2020, where people tended to blame the year 2020. Like you saw it a lot on social media where people would point out or you know complain about 2020 being the culprit in everything you know crappy going on like all the negative things going on they they like they pointed the finger at 2020 like 2020 was was the problem and i understand that their point is that all these things are happening during that year but to me they're avoiding the real uh antagonist in the situation like it wasn't the year 2020 it wasn't the numbers on a calendar It was certain entities, mainly being government jurisdictions. Yes, you could blame the the virus, but it was more the reaction by the authoritarians in government in charge of these jurisdictions that are making life so miserable for a lot of people. Again, yes, you could point at, you know, the fact that the virus was creating sickness and death. But again, we've gone over it again and again and again. It's not so much the virus as much as how the virus was used to lock down human beings and destroy businesses, right? But the thing is, instead of pointing the finger at the right entity, people are just blaming the year and saying the year sucks. But, I mean, to me that's a cop-out. Complete cop-out. Rather than digging in and seeing what is the problem, how the problem was created, how the problem is being pushed on to us and how to find a solution to that problem we just simply oh 2020 oh 2020 this 2020 that but here's a news flash for you folks the year 2020 had nothing to do with the woes that were that we were experiencing if anything 2020 just a warm-up i mean i'm not trying to sound like a pessimist here but to but to lock everything in 2020 with this false oh 2021 is going to be better to me, is another cop-out. I, I hope 2021's better, but the fact is, as you, as the facts line up, 2020, to me, seems more like a precursor to the Roaring Twenties, but in the opposite effect. And I think, rather than copping out and using 2020 as excuse, if we just face reality, we'll, we will be in a better position to deal with 2021 in the years to come. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that people aren't facing reality. My only point is that let's direct our energy not at a number on a calendar or a relative position of the earth to the sun, but let's direct that anger and frustration at the appropriate targets. Moving on to my second topic, a much more important story from an article published on September 25th, 2020. The headline reads, The pandemic pushes hundreds of millions of people towards starvation and poverty. So essentially, this is an article talking about how the World Food Program, which is some sort of agency run by the UN, is predicting upwards of 270 million people dying of starvation due to the pandemic. I read one quote here out of the article. It says, David Beasley, the executive director of the UN's World Food Program, warned during a September 18th briefing that a wave of hunger and famine still threatens to sweep across the globe. He said his organization needed close to $5 billion to to prevent 30 million people from dying of starvation. According to the agency, some 135 million people around the world face acute food insecurity before the pandemic, and that number is expected to double this year. That's 270 million people. That's something we haven't really considered. 
the fact that when we slow down and shut down economies throughout the world, including ours, you disrupt the food distribution system and and chain or supply chain, not just in this country but around the world. And these developing countries will receive the worst negative impact from that. In that these policies and these lockdown policies will have a resulting effect to kill millions of people worldwide. Millions of people worldwide. And they just said it double. 135 million people double. That's 270 million people worldwide. I mean, do those people not matter? Why is it that the default position, that the immediate reaction whenever we hear about these surges of cases, cases after cases after cases, that people's immediate reaction to when they hear about COVID is more lockdowns, more mitigation efforts, more social distancing, more mask wearing. They always default to these authoritarian measures that are not proven scientifically to work, right? So they do all these things where the science says they actually don't do anything when you objectively look at all the, the studies and not at, you know, politically induced studies. But, it's, but the, if you just look at the science as a whole, you'll see that none of these things, I mean, just look at the numbers, just look at reality. All these things have been happening across the country, especially in states like California, New York, and other places, and the numbers continue to rise. And yet, not only do we have direct effects in this country that screw people over, that force people out of work, that force people into bankruptcy, that force people on the edge of of being evicted that forces the government to spend these massive spending bills to try to help people quote unquote so not only are we destroying our own economies but the but the collateral damage from across the the globe is that millions and millions of people will be forced into starvation that will die from starvation as a result of putting a halt to these economies around the world including ours and yet The immediate reaction, the first instinct driven into us now, I guess, at least to a huge uh, portion of the population is lockdowns, 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 social distancing, mask wearing, all these measures that do not do anything. And I mean, I I, I get like, why am I suddenly, you know, throwing social distance social distancing into the mix because then businesses are forced to not have as many people in the workplace therefore slowing down production and that includes food production and food distribution and now we see these effects right coming from these un organizations so i hate to once again go on another tirade anti-lockdown tirade but my point is that if you look at the big picture it's like we are, it's, on one hand, we are causing misery and suffering for a huge, huge proportion of the population. If not the entire population, we are causing suffering and misery to save a relative small number of people from a disease that has a 99.9% survival rate. We're basically causing misery and suffering for everybody except for a small portion of the population. And I'm not saying that that small portion of the population isn't worth protecting because they are. But the means we are going about to do that by causing misery and suffering on a huge number of people in reality are also causing deaths to even more people. You know, I've already mentioned the deaths from despair in this own country and all the abuse going on and the drug abuse going on. And the suicides going on, but also the after effect of millions of people in these developing countries who are, going, who are basically being wiped out, who are basically being wiped out. The, the global ultra rich are using this pandemic to wipe out the developing world. That's the conclusion I'm coming to. Do not be blind. Open your eyes and look. Just look at the facts. Look at the data. Speaking of looking at the data... Have you seen this new report coming from the NPR? And I'll refer to a story from Breitbart News speaking on the NPR report 
that said disinfecting surfaces using sprays and wipes might not be necessary to prevent the coronavirus. Scientists say that if a person infected with the coronavirus sneezes, talks loudly, or coughs, droplets containing particles of the virus are airborne and can land on surfaces. But Emmanuel Goldman, a microbiologist at Rutgers University, told NPR the risk of getting infected from touching a surface with the virus is low. In hospitals, surfaces have been tested near COVID-19 patients and no infectious virus can be identified, Goldman says. Instead, what is left over is a viral RNA, otherwise known as the corpse of the coronavirus. Back in January and February, scientists thought the coronavirus could be primarily transmitted through surface contamination. A study from the New England Journal of Medicine at the time suggested the virus could live on the surface for days. Because of the results of that study, the public began to wipe down their groceries, disinfect common areas, and even wear gloves. Suckers. But now, scientists are saying that people who disinfect to prevent against the coronavirus might be overdoing it. You don't say. Dr. Kevin Finelli, a respiratory infection specialist with the National Institutes of Health, said there's no scientific data to back up the claims. When you see people doing spray disinfection of streets and sidewalks and walls and subways, I just don't know of any data that supports the fact that we're getting infected from viruses that are jumping up from the sidewalk, he said. Finelli says that the virus is more likely to spread via airborne transmission in indoor public places, adding that ultraviolet germicidal irradiation or using ultraviolet energy to kill viruses is probably the best way to kill the virus being transmitted through the air. Huh. Weird. I remember, what's that guy's name? Trump, I believe. I believe he was the president. Mentioned something about ultraviolet light killing off the virus and people mocking him for saying that. He even made a statement regarding something about using the virus maybe to kill off or using ultraviolet light to kill off the virus in lungs and then he was mocked for that yet the very next day there are companies that already had devices or are coming out with devices that do exactly that because the virus does die in ultraviolet light which is why it's also ridiculous to see people walking around outside with a mask on because at least when it's sunny outside because that virus will just be zapped by the sun anyways weird weird But the science says, exactly, the point is, the science is constantly changing, right? But hey, let's lock everything down and ignore the real numbers and the real results, because you're scared. And you know what, this is what I'm talking about, right? Is, why is it that people like myself, who come out and speak out against all these unnecessary bogus BS lockdown and mitigation efforts that do not work. When, when people like me speak out and point this out, we're the ones being ridiculed and mocked and belittled. We're the ones who are being accused of being the science deniers. I, for one, refuse to be bullied. Bullied. Bullied by this nonsense. You could sit there and point your finger at me and try to call me selfish and ignorant. But really, you are the ones projecting. You authoritarians and you totalitarians pushing pseudoscience to enact ideological policies. All you want is submission and subjugation. Control and social conditioning. That's what you want. I want the truth. I want the facts. And I want freedom and i'm sick and tired of the sanctimonious bs coming from people who deny science to include healthcare workers i know i might piss off a lot of people when i say this but i refuse to put people up on a pedestal regardless of your occupation that alone does not determine my level of respect for you like i treat everybody on the same basic level of respect 
and it could rise or lower depending on how you are as an individual. And expect the same to me. For example, I'm not going to put military or law enforcement or emergency personnel or healthcare workers or nurses or whatever or teachers on this elevated pedestal. And if anything, this the last year, 2020, only proved that further. For instance, I've already mentioned the absolute bogus TikTok videos of nurses and medical personnel dancing on the graves of the dead, putting out these videos, these choreographed videos of dancing and smiling and having a gee golly good old time on the backs of the dead. In fact, I heard on Tim Pool's show about how there was a video of a family in an ER room waiting for service and it was taking forever and they hear a bunch of noise and they go and see what the, the noise is all about and they see these choreographed dances by doctors and nurses. And they're like, is that why it's taking forever to get service? Yes, yes, that's exactly why. And I tried finding this video all over the internet all morning long and I cannot find it. Hmm, censorship maybe? But what you can do is a simple Google search. Go to doctor's block car into the Google search bar. And you will see pictures, and I remember this happening, it happened in Denver, of people in their, well, I'll say healthcare workers, in their PPE, right? And they're like gowns with their mask on. And they're standing in front of cars during anti-lockdown protests. So they come out and speak out against these lockdown protesters, if you remember that happening, right? And like there was one in Denver in particular that I'm looking at. Again, an easy search on Google. Just type in doctor's block protesters or doctor's block car. And you'll see these guys, these quote unquote healthcare workers standing in front of cars blocking these protests. And I just, there's a number of things there. A, are those even real healthcare workers? Because what kind of healthcare worker in their right minds would come outside in their full getup? Especially at that time where they had to go into work and you, there was plenty of videos showing them get, you know, being dressed in the proper PPE. And so they're going to forego all those things to come outside. So either A, this is fake and it was people trying to make a political point. Or it was healthcare workers going out to make a political point. Either way, it's ridiculous. Considering the, the fact that only a couple months later, after the George Floyd incident, and there are massive, massive protests all over the country, you know, and, and suddenly all the advice about social distancing and, you know, protests. Remember, they, they're, they're speaking out against the anti-lockdown protests as super spreader events and people disregarding social distancing and, you know, selfish people that wanted grandmas to die. And, you know, baby people are too ignorant for their own good. Yet when it came to the George Floyd protest... Suddenly, that cause was okay, right? Now, you know, screw social distancing. You know, maybe half the people wore masks. Oh, who cares? Because now they're fighting for a cause that we suddenly believe in, right? So now that it was a politically, politically expedient, it was okay. And then a simple Google search, doctors join Floyd protesters, and you'll see dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of images of the same sort of thing of healthcare workers and their PPE, doctors and nurses and such, outside standing with the protesters in these massive crowds but now it's okay now they're holding signs and now they're on now because of the cause they're fighting for i guess you know the coronavirus doesn't matter anymore or the, the cause is, is more important than the you know the spread of the virus again it's hypocrisy the double standard and the hypocrisy we have to hold these people up on this pedestal because they're the heroes they're the frontline workers and again, I'm speaking gener- generally here. I'm not saying every single rank and file person falls in this category. But just, I mean, simple Google searches, right? You see them standing in front of these anti-lockdown protests, being all self-righteous. And then in the very next moment, you see them joining protests, you know, in lockstep, hand in hand with them. Blame hypocrisy. It's just like I talked about in the last episode of these despotic governors and government officials who enact these lockdown policies and restrictions and then blatantly break them and don't care. And they totally get away with it. And they totally get away with it, by the way. 
Did any one of those governors or officials resign or get fired or recalled? No. I mean, there is an effort to recall Governor Newsom, and I am 100% behind that effort, by the way. But whether it was these sanctimonious nurses and doctors and medical professionals or these despotic government officials, it's a double standard. If you fall in line with what they are saying, then it's okay to break these certain uh, restrictions, right? But if you dare, if you dare speak out against them, now you are enemy of the state. And adding on to these hypocrites and another block of people in our society who have been put on such a huge pedestal, and I brought this up before, teachers. And I'm not trying to offend you teachers out there. I really am not. But I've already discussed with that if you look at the science, it's such a small percentage of a risk to take of getting sick from the children to the teachers. If anything, it goes in the other direction, right? Yet schools are refusing to open, and it's mainly the unions. And then let's look at this headline here it's from Breitbart News. Socialist Chicago Teachers Union leader resists unsafe schools reopening from from Puerto Rico poolside. Let's see. The story says a leader of the Chicago Teachers Union wants kids to remain out of the classroom because schools are quote-unquote unsafe. But she made the claims in the midst of a sunny vacation in Puerto Rico. Sarah Chambers, who WGN said is on the union's executive board and an area vice president and claims she led four strikes, is opposed to schools returning to in-person learning on Monday. Chambers made several posts on Twitter this week attacking the plan. Just a few hours earlier, Chambers posted a picture on Instagram that appears to show her poolside in Puerto Rico and talking about going to Old San Juan for seafood, WGN reported. In a post on Instagram on an account that has now been made private, (laughs) Chambers wrote, Spending the last day of 2020 by the poolside. We have the whole pool to ourselves. Then we are going to Old San Juan to get some yummy seafood Mofungo. On Twitter, Chambers identified herself as a socialist. We have an entire private Airbnb house to ourselves, she bragged in a post that showed her feet at the end of a lounge chair with a pool and palm trees in the background. In another post, Chamber mugged for the camera from her towel with a caption that read, Pool Life. WGN noted the CTU, that's the union, is threatening the possibility of a strike if the district pushes ahead with plans to reopen school buildings. After the news story ran, Chambers took to Twitter to lash out. If you haven't had someone break into your house and try to strangle and assault you in your house or COVID 60 plus days where you could barely walk or talk this year, then don't talk to me, she said. Okay, well, okay, well, the point is, once again, once again, you you have these hypocrites like her, a teacher, a you know, union leader, you know, saying that, you know, coming out so hard against schools reopening. And then she hasn't mentioned she had COVID and, you know, it's the whole victim persona. It's their hero and their victim, right? (laughs) Just the blatant hypocrisy, you know. Again, there's people being forced out of work on the verge of eviction, there's people whose entire livelihoods have been destroyed, destroyed. And yeah, they might not be paying attention to these things. Like someone made the comment to me about the the nurses and stuff, uh, nurses and people dancing that, oh, well, the people being forced out of the business, they're not paying attention to that stuff. And maybe they're not because they have these real problems to worry about. But it's the principle. It's the fact that people's entire lives have been wiped out that they've been reduced to nothing yet here are people who are getting paid by the government and i've talked about this before right they still get paid by the government regardless whether they're working or not and here's this person who's in on you know, on vacation in puerto rico coming out against schools reopening and she gets to you know lounge in on vacation 
And I'm not saying they can't go on vacation, but it's the fact that they come out and they speak out against schools opening, right? They essentially are furthering the lockdowns, perpetuating, you know, the people being out of work. Because again, I talked about how people have to, how there are many people who can't go back to work, even if they could now because they have to watch their kids. It's just disrupted the whole system, right? And here she is, and she has the audacity and probably the stupidity to post it on social media so people see it, right? So get the hell out of here. These people, she is an authoritarian who, in my opinion, because of her blatant hypocrisy, she should be held accountable. Fire her ass. Fire her. At the minimum, she should be fired from her post in the union, let alone fired from the school. I mean, talk about a terrible teacher and a terrible example. Now, I feel bad. I mean, she's one of those rotten apples. I don't mean to paint all teachers with her, but she's definitely one of the bad apples out there. And she is an example not only of the hypocrisy, but of the rottenness and corruption of these school unions. And that leads me to another profession that I mentioned earlier. And again, I know I might piss off a lot of people by saying this, but I would go on, uh, I'm, I'm willing to go on a limb and say that in 2020, law enforcement, generally speaking, failed. They failed. And it came from two different things. One was from when we had these huge, quote-unquote, peaceful protests that always seemed to, once the sun set, turn into riots and looting, the police failed in these big cities. And let's be real, there there are mainly blue cities and blue states that were essentially telling their police to stand down. But but that's what you saw, right? You saw this looting and rioting and... For the most part, the police were just standing there letting it happen. And you could say they were following orders, sure. But is one of the basic tenets of being a law enforcement officer is to enforce the law? And does that not mean protecting the business? (laughs) Look at the irony, folks. So the same businesses that were forced to shut down because of the, you know, lockdowns via the virus, right? And now their entire livelihoods are being taken out from under them. They're being forced into bankruptcy. And then in some places, the lockdowns had kind of opened up a little bit. So now they're, they have a chance to try to, you know, regain some sort of means stay open. And now we have these mobs destroying, you know, looting, physically destroying, and burning down their businesses. <laughs> right? Basically to finishing them off. And the police in a lot of these big cities just stood there and, and allowed it to happen. They might have been following orders, but they're breaking their oaths, and that's why I think the appropriate term, oath breakers, applies. There's so much footage of it, and you could talk to a lot of people who've been there and seen this happen. The police just stood there. I watched here in San Diego a strip mall get destroyed, looted, and I watched a Facebook Live video of this happening in real time, and the whole time I'm like, all right, the police are going to show up any second, right? And I watched it for 45 solid minutes before the police arrived. And the police were there. They were just in the background, right? So that was an anecdotal example. But my point is that clearly happened across the country in major cities. In fact, I could even point the finger at Trump in a sense, right? Because he only offered his help. But if there was any, if there was ever a time, in my opinion, to call any sort of insurrection act... And to override these local governors and mayors. And yes, I'm a federalist and I'm not saying that should be a thing. But when these governors and mayors are failing to protect the citizens that they are responsible for protecting, then maybe Trump had the case. And I think a lot of people would have supported him on this to come in with the military and at the bare minimum protect these properties and protect lives. I mean, there's plenty of videos of these business owners being attacked by these mobs. And usually it's minority on minority. Or at least in many cases, an easy you know, video search, you, you can see this. And it's heartbreaking to watch. 
And there are plenty of examples of these business owners being beaten to, to pieces. I know it's easy for me to say that, you know, why didn't the police step in and, and stop it? But that is what they're paid to do. That is what they took an oath to do. I don't care what your mayor said. And if I was one of these business owners, I would be suing the hell out of these cities and police departments. And then what made it even more infuriating is once again, an easy Google search. I'm doing it right here on my phone. Of police kneeling with protesters. Or National Guard, in the few instances where they were called in by the governors, kneeling with protesters. And there's image after image after image after image after image of police and National Guard kneeling with the protesters. <sighs> Again, if that's what they want to do on their you know, personal time, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. I'm all for peaceful protest. And if someone in the National Guard or a police officer wants to join them, go for it. But you don't do it in uniform. And you definitely don't do it when you're in the active service of your job. When you're, when you're actively doing your job, you don't do it. Right? It's, it should be law and order. And you should be making sure that the, the protests stay peaceful, not joining in the protest. Like me personally, I would never kneel in these situations because to me, to kneel for other people is debasing yourself. I would only kneel in like a church or for a prayer, but I'm not going to kneel for the needs of other people or I'm not going to kneel for whatever cause they're, they're saying that I need to kneel for. I'm not going to do it, right? And I, I realize a lot of these people probably caved in the peer pressure because they had a, a literal mob in front of them, but these are police officers and National Guardsmen. It's embarrassing. They should be ashamed of themselves. And if any of those people were in positions of leadership, they should have already resigned if not been fired. That is outrageous, especially in many of those instances where as soon as the sun set, it turned, on, turned into all-out riots, and these businesses were destroyed as they stood there and watched. And then to top it off, to top it off, the thing that really made me lose faith in the law enforcement community, and there's so many examples of this, is on one hand you have the police standing down essentially in these big blue cities when the riots are going down. And then on the other hand, when these dictums came down from governors, mayors, and you know county health officials to enforce these lockdown measures, <laughs> the police follow those orders, right? How many examples are out there? How many examples are out there where you see or have seen police crack down on people merely trying to live their lives or run their businesses so they don't go bankrupt, right? There's so many videos. I mean, I, I, I've been saying people need to rise up. People need to fight back. And there have been examples of that. And even early on, though, they're, they're, they're just, you could easily find them. At least you could. I wouldn't be surprised if these are taken off the internet at this point. But there are video. There, you know, there's a famous uh, video or story of it was like the surfer in California and the police. There's a little lone surfer out in the ocean, right? No one around him. Sun is out, ultraviolet light, right? And the police are essentially forcing him out of the ocean and, and arresting him. You know, there's there's videos of, uh, you know, a mom in a, in a park with her kids being arrested, right? There's, uh, in New York, there's footage of, a, a restaurant owner where the police come and give him a huge ticket claiming because he had his door open and he's doing takeout but because he had his door open that he was you know allowing people to eat inside of his restaurant right and they're giving him a ticket and <sighs> there's just so many examples you know c police coming down and cracking down on gym owners in like new york and new jersey here's a story right here from fox news of a california bar owner I'll read the headline. California bar, California bar owner could get one year behind bars for repeated openings during pandemic. Report. The business owner became the first in Orange County to face a criminal charge for operating during the pandemic, a report said. The owner and employee of a Southern California bar and restaurant could each face a year behind bars following a dispute at the business in mid-December, according to a report. 
Authorities say the Costa Mesa Bar's manager, Luisa Morrow, is accused of physically trying to prevent a uniformed police officer from entering the West End Bar on December 12th. Meanwhile, Morrow's boss, bar owner Roland Barrera, is accused of repeatedly opening the business in violation of coronavirus-related restrictions and curfews, report said. <gasps> no way! How dare he try to not go bankrupt? Barrera became the first Orange County business owner to face a criminal charge for operating during the pandemic, the Orange County Register reported. Barrera kept reopening the business despite repeated attempts by law enforcement and the city code enforcement officers to educate their, I like that too, quote-unquote, educate the bar owner on the law. The law, yeah, the law, my ass. The Office of Orange County District Attorney Todd Spitzer said in news release according to fox 11 but costa mesa mayor katrina foley said the days of quote-unquote education about the law are now over oh so now we're just going to straight oppression okay we are at a junction now where we are in a public health crisis probably bordering on a disaster disaster with a 99.9 percent survival rate days of continued education of what people already know and and are defying intentionally are over how dare they defy it was quite apparent that they were thumbing their noses at the public health orders. No, they're thumbing their noses at tyrants like yourself, actually. Costa Mesa Police, Code Enforcement Officers, and representatives of the State Department of Alcohol Beverage Control, sounds like a completely useless uh, government agency that should not exist, have visited the bar on numerous occasions since a statewide curfew took effect in mid-November. Let's see. Both Barrera and Mara are scheduled to be arraigned June 22nd, but could avoid jail time if they avoid further violations. The DA's office said. Spitzer called the alleged repeated violations a slap in the face of hardworking business owners who continue to try to do their right. No, you are the one slapping the business owners in the face, Spitzer. Get the hell out of here. Get the hell out of here. It's the, these tyrants. These, these tyrants. These despots and these tyrants, I swear. Elsewhere, however, some California bar and restaurant owners have claimed that doing the right thing may be putting them out of business. You don't say. You don't say. In December, the owner of a bar and restaurant in Los Angeles filed a lawsuit in federal court claiming, claiming Governor Gavin Newsom, Newsom's ban on outdoor dining has been overly broad and not based on scientific evidence. Exactly. Exactly. L.A. tried to say that they had scientific evidence, yet when they went to court and the, and the judge asked them to prevent the evidence, they said they had no evidence. <laughs> Also in December, a restaurant owner in Contra Costa County in Northern California said his customers were holding quote-unquote picnic protests using their own chairs outside to help the business owner avoid fines. You see what people ha are having to resort to? This, this absolute ridiculousness? Don't you love just seeing like, like the, tents, the tent cities for you know, restaurants being built outside? It's like they basically have the restaurant on the parking lot in a tent. And I'm just sitting there like, it's probably actually safer with the, the ventilation, you know, system from inside the restaurant. I mean, do you guys realize there are actual means? If the government wanted to help these restaurants, there are actual means that this can be done, right? Like, put HEPA filters on the ACs and use ultraviolet lighting. Boom. All right? That's just, this is a suggestion from little old me. But I'm just saying, there are other means. Right? In New York, you see people in bubbles. Those bubbles are going to do nothing, by the way. Plexiglass and these bubbles, that, that's completely, again, it's like a placebo effect, but has, has no effect scientifically whatsoever. Right? But HEPA filters and ultraviolet lighting, and you could do some social distancing, sure. That makes more sense. Right? And again, that's me thinking of that up in two seconds. And I'm sure you get, you know, smart people and these innovators together, they'll come up with just as good, probably way better, reasonable efforts, right, that actually affect people in a positive way rather than this complete nonsense. Anyways, moving on to my third topic, another point I wanted to bring up was don't you guys find it peculiar how the same group of people that are now pushing vaccine cards to prove that you got the vaccine are the exact same people that are aggressively against voter ID. Isn't that strange? Like, just think about it in your own life. Or maybe it's yourself. And just think of the irony in that. Like, you demand to know, or they demand to know, who has had the vaccine, 
right? But when it comes to voting, it doesn't matter who you are, right? It just it just seems so weird to me that that's a thing. That's a thing where, you know, an election that can determine some very dramatic, important things in people's lives in the direction of the country versus did someone get a vaccine for a virus that has a 99.9 percentage of survival rate? It just seems so weird to me. And I'm sure a lot of people do not see the irony in that. Where people that are 100% against IDs when it comes to voting are 100% for IDs when it comes to vaccines. And that they see it as two different issues. Mind-boggling. That moves me on to my final topic. And I'm going to turn my attention to the federal government. There exist so many unnecessary federal agencies... We could list them and go on about each one of them for hours. I'll talk about two or three of them, but for sure, there's one that's been in the headlines lately. And first, before I even get there, let me kind of set the stage for you. Is we have the federal government, which is supposed to remain in its constraints of the U.S. Constitution. Now, several moments throughout our history, it's broken out of those constraints and grown and grown and grown. Whether that was, whether that was during the Civil War era, or prior to World War One with Woodrow Wilson and the Federal Reserve Act and the creation of the Income Tax, Sixteenth Amendment, or the New Deal under FDR with huge massive programs like Social Security, FDIC, to name a couple, but there are plenty more. To the Cold War and the creation of the military industrial complex, which entrenched the deep state. To LBJ and the Great Society, the war on poverty, to the war on drugs, all the way to 9 11 and the Patriot Act. And basically, The federal government has broken every constraint that exists in the Constitution and is involved in almost every aspect of human life and interaction at the local level. Whether it be schools, whether it be cars, just there's so many federal regulations. And the administrative state has spiraled into a massive managerial super state with their tentacles in everything. And that's not what's supposed to be. If you really understand federalism, it's you know, the, the, the power is, comes from the people and you lend it a little bit of power to your local officials and a little bit more power to your county officials and a little bit more power to you know, state officials. But now it's backwards, right? And with that and these huge ballooning budgets, and one reason why the budget's out of control is they fund so many agencies that just shouldn't even exist or only have a detrimental effect to the republic. And a couple I'm going to name are direct threats to democracy, in my opinion. And so one of those is the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. And a lot of people might be like, oh, of course you're going to say that. You're, you're a gun guy. Well, yes, to me, the right of self-preservation is extremely important to me. And to me, it should be extremely important to society. And apparently it is, if you look at the massive, huge amount of gun, record gun sales have happened in 2020, where each month and like quarter, like they broke the records in gun sales, and it's super hard to find ammunition. So I'm not the only one, apparently, that thinks that that is a fundamental right. And so, of course, a, an agency like the ATF, which to me, its mere existence is a threat to the well-being of every American citizen and an absolute threat to democracy in our republic. And why do I say this? Well, first of all, I'm going to refer to an article about a new congresswoman elect, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and I'll, and she's mentioned in this article by American Military News, 
where the headline is Congresswoman elect calls for ATF to be defunded and eliminated. I could not agree more. I mean, really, if you look at the Second Amendment itself, and I'll read it for you, quote, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, end quote. And so, yes, I could go into an entire argument against gun control, and I could go into all this, the, the, the reasons why it was originally, gun control was originally initiated for racist gun laws, right? To keep guns out of slaves, keep guns out of minorities' hands. In California, it started with the Black Panthers and keeping guns out of their hands after they stormed the, the state capitol and how it disproportionately affects minorities and poor communities from protecting themselves from gangbangers who refuse to even follow gun laws and get guns off the black market so it only affects law-abiding citizens and i could get in all the numbers and all these things but right now i'm going to center and center the argument on the fact that the atf is an indirect violation of the second amendment shall not be infringed means shall not be infringed and the mere existence of the atf is that it is an organization whose sole purpose is to infringe on the right to bear arms. But let's go back to this article. So again, from the AmericanMilitaryNews.com, it says, Georgia Congresswoman-elect Marjorie Taylor Greene called the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, ATF, quote, oppressive, in a tweet calling for the government agency to be defunded and abolished. That's heaven to my ears. It really is. Ten years ago today, U.S. Border Patrol agent Brian Terry was murdered in cold blood with a gun provided to Mexican drug cartels through Barack Obama and Eric Holder's ATF Fast and Fears program. The Congresswoman-elect's tweet said, The ATF is an oppressive government agency that should be defunded and eliminated. Literally heaven to my ears. Green's tweet referred to the 2010 operation Fast and Furious that allowed illegal gun sales to take place in an effort said to track buyers and sellers linked to Mexican drug cartels. The operation failed when almost 2,000 firearms were illegally bought for $1.5 million, leading to the murder of Border Patrol agent Brian Terry in what quickly became known as one of the Obama Biden Obama Biden's administration's earliest scandals. Oh, but I thought Obama had never had any scandals. But the fact is he did have some scandals and I remember this one when it was happening. Cuz essentially they were forcing these gun shops and these gun shop owners to to sell guns to known cartel members, right? And then there are whistleblowers on this. You can look all this up. And they essentially forced these gun owners, or excuse me, these gun shop owners, you know, these, these gun sellers at, at shops in Texas along the Texas border to knowingly sell to cartel agents, right? Because they were going to, quote unquote, track the guns and see where they went. But as soon as the guns were sold off, they essentially lost track of all the guns, right? So you could say it comes down to two things, either one, complete incompetence of the atf you know two a stupid idea in the first place or three and this is where you know you could put your start to put your tinfoil hats on but i i buy into this they are trying to sell and put so many firearms from the states into mexico so that way they could skew the numbers and blame america for you know, sending all these guns illegally to Mexico and jack up the numbers. Because that's something that Hillary Clinton was in the government at the time, right, Secretary of State. And their whole argument was that America is supplying the cartels with guns. So what other way to prove that than to secretly sell them these guns and lose them, and then they could turn around and point the finger at America saying, see, see, it's, it's, it's you guys, you're the problem. But Luckily, there were whistleblowers, and unluckily, a Border Patrol agent was killed, along with hundreds, if not thousands, of innocent Mexican citizens that were killed by these guns. The whole thing is ridiculous. And of course, the media were psychophants for Obama, so they kept their mouths shut about the whole thing. So going on in the article, 
Following her initial declaration, Green tweeted two articles, the first alleging rogue ATF agents were cracking down on legal guns ahead of the Biden administration's anticipated firearms restrictions, and another claiming leaders of the agency have been colluding with Biden's transition team in an effort to ban pistol braces. According to the first article, Emma Lan reported that federal agents raided the headquarters of Polymer 80, a manufacturer of homemade gun accessories, often re- referred to as ghost guns by critics. Critics. The firearm accessory creator had reportedly been producing 80% complete low receivers for years, which falls under the ATF's non-regulatable firearm standard. The receivers did not require a manufacturer's license, serial number, or a, or a NICS check prior to purchase. CNN, fake news right there, reported that the ATF recently determined 80% kits are firearms, but Polymer 80 claims it never received a warning of the change in the regulation prior to agents attempting to confiscate customer information. So dangerous. Jason Davis, Polymer 80 attorney, said the company has always cooperated with the ATF and will continue to do so, adding that the company takes its legal obligations seriously and is dedicated to vigorously protecting its rights under the law. In the second article, MLN reported that ATF Acting Director Regina Lombardo said the Biden transition team had already reached out to the ATF in order to under the agency's top priorities. According to MLN, Lombardo said her priorities targeted pistol braces and 80% lower receivers. The ATF is a law enforcement agency under the U.S. Department of Justice that seeks to protect Americans from violent criminals, criminal organizations, the legal use and trafficking of firearms and explosives, acts of ar- arson and bombings and terrorism. So to go back on this 80% thing, if you go back and look at the Gun Control Act of 1968, it says that you can have a lower receiver of any firearm, whether that would be a rifle or a pistol, that is 80% complete, meaning you have a block of metal, but the, but it's just that. It's just a block of metal. The, the insides of it have not been milled out, so it's just one solid block. And you could sell that. That's not a firearm, so it does not fall under selling a firearm so you don't need to do a background check you don't have to pay firearms taxes on it right that you don't have to uh transfer using a federal firearms license like all those things you're just literally selling a block of metal right and the fact that this agency could just willy-nilly change the law at the, the snap of a finger and now all those people who, who do those, who either own or sell those type of things suddenly become criminals is bogus and ridiculous. This is what I mean. The Congress has a responsibility as per the Constitution to create laws. However, they create these agencies and abdicate their responsibilities for creating these laws to these agencies who then go and change policies at will based off political preferences and expediency, and therefore, instead of having elected officials that we vote for making laws and policies, it now falls onto unelected bureaucrats dictating policies onto the American public who are therefore unaccountable, or at least held unaccountable, because they are just part of the bureaucratic blob rather than direct representatives we can speak to and vote for or against. Now we're going up against the whole system. And that is dangerous. That is dangerous. Because not only are they becoming lawmakers and enforcers into one branch, essentially, but they take arbitrary means. It's not like they are basing this off scientific data or studies or anything. It's just whatever an unelected bureaucrat deems good or bad, essentially becomes law. Some things might be written into law, which are still ridiculous, like the you know the minimum of a 16-inch barrel for a rifle, right? Like a rifle has to have a minimum of 16-inch barrel length. So, you know, 15 inches and three-fourths of an inch illegal, right? 14-inch illegal. However, a handgun, you know, a pistol can obviously have a shorter barrel because, you know, obviously that's safer, right? Like, it doesn't make any sense. So, just like with these pistol braces, they were originally for AR pistols, AR-15 pistols, which, again, have barrels less than 
16 inches, so therefore now they're a pistol, but you can't put a stock on them, otherwise they become a short barrel rifle, which then you have to go through and get, you know, basically you're going through the ATF to get a NFA stamp, a $200 tax stamp, right? And it takes like a year to even get the approval for this. So people made braces, which were originally meant for disabled people to shoot these guns easier. And then it came down to a written memo from the ATF saying, oh, okay, you can use them as, you can shoulder them. Like, basically, if you hold it out in front of you, it's legal. But the moment you put it up against your shoulder, it's illegal. But now because it's a written memo, we'll make it okay. And then now they're going back on that and saying, to even own a brace now, you need the stamp. And therefore, if you have the brace without the $200 tax stamp, you're, you're a felon. You, you see how arbitrary and ridiculous this gets? And it's just these unelected bureaucrats making these decisions. And then to her point, the congresswoman's point about how they are colluding with the Biden transition team to, you know, enact these policies and changes. And how is that not scary right there? How is that not a direct threat to your Second Amendment rights? And you know, not to mention all the things that Biden wants to do from, you know, quote unquote assault weapons bans to banning, buying any type of ammunition or even accessories online, which would definitely affect people in more rural areas. Right. I mean, that's just a ridiculous notion in the first place. They, you couldn't even buy, say, a sling. You couldn't even buy a sling online because that would be considered an accessory. Just, these ridiculous methods that do nothing to stop gun crime by criminals, actual criminals, right? It only affects law-abiding citizens. Or the fact that he wants to turn all magazines over 10 rounds. And, you know, they use the term high-capacity magazines. And a magazine is... You know, in slang terms, they say clip, but that's more of an ignorant statement. The magazine that, that holds the rounds, right, the cartridges, they say anything over 10 is high cap, high capacity. Well, that's bogus because that's standard, like 15 rounds, 30 rounds, depending on, on the firearm. That's a standard, not high capacity. That's standard capacity. But with that being said, they want to ban anything over 10 or therefore make that a or at least uh, therefore make that require a tax stamp, another $200 tax stamp for every single magazine you already own over 10. And again, who does that affect? But, you know, people who can't afford that. So that's so who does that affect? It's going to affect, you know, lower income people, right? It's just a means, if they can't outright ban them, they just create all these laws that essentially ban them, you know? And then like the false term mandatory buybacks. How's <laughs> There's no such thing as a mandatory buyback. It's confiscation. Just like when they talk about a universal background checks. They already have background checks. But if you want, quote unquote, universal background checks, the only way to enforce a, quote unquote, universal background check is to create a national database. And the only way to create a national database would be to have a national registration. And then that's just a, a skip away from national database, national registration to national mandatory buyback to confiscation which at the end of the day that's that's what they really want and who would be at the head of this situation it would be the atf right and this is why i join congresswoman marjorie taylor green for defunding eliminating abolishing the atf it's time we do it it's long overdue i'm not saying there aren't any good rank and file guys in there and I know they play a role with, you know, explosives. But, you know, there's this other huge agency called the FBI, which technically is probably on my list too, at least for a massive at least for massive reforms that need to be done at the top, right? Because their leadership is definitely corrupt. And we could go into that later. I'll probably dedicate a whole episode to the corruption of the leadership of the FBI. But I think that, you know, I'm sure the FBI has their own explosives section that you could take the agents that are good at that and absorb them in the FBI after they are audited and reformed themselves. But the next agency I want to talk about is the TSA. I've had a few run-ins with the TSA myself, but it's not even about me. It's definitely not about me. So you had 9-11, you had the Patriot Act, you had the creation of a whole new department of government, which I'm always against. I'm all for decentralization and you know small government not you know more centralization and more government but they created a whole new branch department of homeland security 
you know, consolidated a bunch of agencies and stuff into, into them. And one thing that came about that was the creation of the Transportation Security Administration. And I don't know about you, but another incompetent agency. And the saddest thing is, is a security theater that is performed every single time you walk into an airport. But the worst thing is, and the more important thing is, and let's just face it, despite what they may say or claim, the moment you walk into an airport, your civil liberty is out the door. Right? Like, you have no rights. I don't care what they say or try to say or claim. You have no rights the moment you walk into an airport. You're a complete subject to the state. There's no denying that, right? You want to put up a, a fight against a TSA agent, you're going to jail. It's as simple as that. Like, they themselves become authoritarian dictators just in their mere existence being there. There's nothing you can say or do against them. They, they want to fill up on your private parts? That will happen. I know because it's happened to me. But again, it's not about me. It's the fact that they go through all these measures, but at the end of the day... It's just a show. It's like going to the movies. A cinematic performance. Because in reality, when you look at the numbers, they are preventing nothing. I mean, yes, we haven't had any 9-11 events happen, but I don't think that's because of the TSA. The fact of the matter is, we have been conditioned to accept all these blatant violations on civil liberties. Most people do not want to go against the flow, and that is what the government bets on and thrives on. Since 9-11, people have stomached the TSA and have willingly, for the most part, given up all their rights at the airport. But it is an illusion of security. An illusion of security. There have been plenty of stories about how the TSA has been an abject failure. And let's look at the evidence. Let's see, 2015, ABC News, exclusive, undercover DHS test find security failures at U.S. airports. Mock explosives, weapons smuggled through checkpoints, investigation reveals. An internal investigation of the TSA revealed security failures at dozens of the nation's busiest airports where undercover investigators were able to smuggle mock explosives or banned weapons through checkpoints in 95% of trials. The series of tests were conducted by home land security red teams who pose as passengers setting out to beat the system. According to officials briefed on the results of a recent Homeland Security Inspector General's report, TSA agents failed 67 out of 70 tests, with red team members repeatedly able to get potential weapons through checkpoints. In one test, an undercover agent was stopped after setting off an alarm at a mag magnometer, but TSA screeners failed to detect a fake explosive device that was taped to his back during a follow-on pat-down. Officials would not divulge the exact time period of the testing other than to say it concluded recently. <laughs> I mean, I could go on and on with that story. It goes on for paragraphs. But let's jump to November 2017. <laughs> it's almost the same headline. TSA fails most tests and latest undercover operation at U.S. airports. Sources said the results were an improvement from two years ago. Okay, sure. In recent undercover tests of multiple airport security checkpoints by the DHS, inspectors said screeners, their equipment or their procedures failed more than half the time, according to a source familiar with the classified report. When ABC News asked the source if the failure rate was 80%, their, the response was, you are in the ballpark. This, this is sad. In a public hearing after a private classified briefing to the House Committee on Homeland Security, members of Congress called the failures by the TSA disturbing. <laughs> disturbing, huh? Rep. Mike Rogers went as far as to tell TSA administrator so-and-so, I don't even know if it's probably not the same guy, this agency that you run is broken badly and it needs your attention. Inspectors identified vulnerabilities with TSA screener performance, screening equipment, and associated procedures, according to a statement from the DHS. The statement added that the findings remain classified, but that eight recommendations have been made to the TSA to improve checkpoint security. It's not clear what those recommendations are. Let's jump to 2020. Forbes story. February, so fairly recently. TSA is failing to check whether its screening equipment works properly. <laughs> of course. 
A report issued in December by the U.S. Government Accountability Office stated flatly that once security screening equipment is installed at an airport, nothing ever is done to make sure that it continues to operate up to prescribed security standards. Even as those machines age and are stressed by hundreds of thousands or even millions of passengers passing through them every year, nothing is ever done to compare their real-life performance to the same technical performance standards they were required to meet upon their initial installation. The GAO's report states flatly, TSA does not ensure that screening technologies continue to meet detection requirements after deployment to the airport. (laughs) Such a joke. They are literally a joke. So you have to go through... Sometimes you have to be humiliated by these guys. And uh, and this whole time, they have a 70%, 80%, 95% failure rate. They have equipment that's not screened or, you know, screened after the fact. (sighs) Why do we put up with this? Why? It's fear. It's always fear-driven. It's always fear-driven. You know, obviously I'm not going to say we should abolish it. I mean, yes, we should abolish the TSA. It's it's time to, to end this illusion of, of security, right? This cinematic performance, let's just get rid of that. And I think privatization will help because then, and this goes for any government agency, with privatization, at least we could hold the companies and the contractors you know, accountable and we could fire people that screw up. Right, because it's it's hard to fire people that work in the government. Once they're entrenched in that bureaucracy, it's so hard to get rid of these people, and that's one reason the TSA is so incompetent and corrupt. They need to be held accountable for when they make these screw ups, right? Because they're probably only failing upwards every time they do these, you know, tests. I'm sure they're only failing upwards, but it's time we privatize privatize them. Therefore. Hey, you screwed up this test, you're fired. Hey, you, uh, you know, violated this person's civil rights or civil liberties and it wasn't necessary, you're fired. We need to start firing these people. It's just one huge bloated bureaucracy. And, I mean, they have equipment that's not even, you know, being maintained properly. They, people are getting through. What a joke. What a joke. Nothing but a bunch of losers, in my opinion. And, you know, again, I know I'm I'm speaking very generally here, and there's probably good people that work there. I I know. I've I've talked to them. But as an organization, talk about incompetence, corruption, and just a laughingstock. And yet we're forced to take them seriously, right? Because these people could, you know, destroy your life. You have no power against these people. They literally are dictators. All powerful dictators. And yet... They get away with all this blatant incompetence. And that, to me, is corruption. Speaking of corruption, another agency I was planning to discuss was the IRS. However, at this point in the show, we've already pushed past the hour point, and I would like to wrap up the show. But before I go, I will at least mention a headline from the Washington Post from back in November. IRS plans a 50% ramp up and audits of small businesses next year. And what a kick to the nuts. Seriously, a kick straight to the nuts. The story goes on to say, the IRS is hiring 50 more specialized auditors to work these cases. In other words, they are hiring more people to terrorize these already struggling businesses. Talk about an unrelenting assault on small business. From the corrupt power structure. The corporate oligarchy wants to finish off these small businesses in the next year. Again, how do we as a country continually put up with this absolute BS? It's mind-bending. Anyways, in conclusion, I hope I did not make myself a target to these agencies that I just railed against. (laughs) But if I have, then oh well. My only hope is to expose all this lunacy and rottenness for what it is, and that one day this all leads to a drastic reduction in the size and scope of the government. You have been listening to the Aaron Burr Broadcast on the Free Thought Doctrine.